I have rights antecedent to all earthly government, rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human law, rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. The rights come before government. That's, that's the, that is the definition of a natural right. It's what is, are called natural rights or, uh, to quote uh, the commentary in the Geneva Bible, uh, the laws of God, or natural, or what the philosophers call natural rights, or lawyers call the law of nations. Those are the laws that come before government, or as stated by Thomas Jefferson. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed all their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of people, that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but by his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, in, that his justice cannot sleep forever. And in fact, what he was referring there, to there was slavery. What, it, what, what they knew when they set up their state republics was that the rights that they had didn't come from government. They had been a, obtained through a long train of violent and nonviolent protest against government. I really, I really enjoy the New Hampshire Constitution. People like to say that the New Hampshire Constitution uh, is a knockoff on the math Constitution for Massachusetts, but it's really not. You have to understand the constitutional history of New Hampshire. New Hampshire was the first state on this side of the Atlantic to have the Constitution. We had that Constitution before the Declaration of Independence. New Hampshire is a state of firsts. New Hampshire had the first battle for the American Revolution. The first ride, Paul Revere, was when he rode up to Portsmouth in December of 1774 and told the people of Portsmouth that General Gage was sending a uh, company of men up to Fort William and Mary, which the people of New Hampshire had just stocked with powder and shot. And so when Paul Revere rode up in December of 74 and told them that General Gage was going to be reinforcing the garrison, which at that point was 11 men, the patriots of Newcastle and Portsmouth and Rye got together, marched upon the fort, 400 of them. The men of the fort, looking at this crowd this, well, actually, what would it be? It would be uh, uh, a small regiment of men looked at them and, and rather than firing upon them, fired over their heads and then surrendered the fort. Because they knew, you know, it, with the technology of the time, they had one, maybe two shots that could get off. And then, you know, the other 380 men would be upon them. <laughs> So the only wise thing to do was to fire over their heads and surrender the fort. Then they could say that they had, you know, defended the fort. Well, December 13th, the Patriots come in, they take all of the powder and shot, and they take it up uh, Oyster River and secret it away. And then they thought, you know, there's something else we forgot. They went back and they took all the small cannons <laughs> on the next day. And those Though that powder and shot and cannon is suspected to be what the British were marching to, marching on uh, Concord for, but it is what General what Colonel Stark used when he brought the New Hampshire militia down to help defend in the Battle of Bunker Hill and guaranteed the retreat of the army. So there's the first battle of the American War for Independence in New Hampshire. Then in January, well, in January, early January of 1776, the Patriots of Exeter, that was the capital at the time, uh, were, they were very upset with the governor. So they rolled a cannon up to his front door and <laughs> knocked on the door. He opens the door and at that point he decided it was a really good time to leave the state. He got on a boat. <laughs> Then all of a sudden, the, the people, the, the legislature of New Hampshire realized that they had no form of government. They had 
no system of courts. They had nobody to pass or enforce laws. And so they reasoned that they were obligated to write a constitution. So they wrote the first state constitution. It was really uh, quite interesting because in the, in the preamble they talk about uh, that this is a temporary constitution until this unhappy conflict can be resolved and they can be reunited with Great Britain. Their objective was not to be separated, but to remain part of the British Empire. It had been a good relationship up until this point. But by 1779, it had become apparent to them that there was not going to be a happy resolution to this conflict. Now, all the other states, after the Declaration of Independence in 76, all the other states also wrote their state constitutions, all within about three or four months, except for Massachusetts, which didn't write one until 79, and New Hampshire, they already had one, so they didn't need to write one. It was a temporary one, but they, they had one. And then, by the time 1779 came around, they decided it was time to really do something formal. Well, all the other state constitutions talked about government by consent, but all of those state constitutions had been written by their state legislatures. So you had the people writing the constitution that would confine the laws, write, were the same people that wrote the laws. So that's a bit dangerous, because they're likely to give themselves more power. New Hampshire, John Langdon, then the Speaker of the House, was the Con, uh, called for the world's first constitutional convention. This was important because it was a separate body from the legislature, independent, that would be writing the rules of government. That first constitution, uh, that convention was convened in, in July of 79, and the next year they presented that constitution to the people of New Hampshire, and it failed. In the meantime, New Hampshire, uh, John Adams had drafted one for Massachusetts in, se in September of 79, and theirs had passed. Now, the people of New Hampshire rejected their first constitution because the Bill of Rights was too small, only seven articles, insufficient. And the form of government was really just a codification of the existing form of government, which was uh, too much of a concentration of power. In fact, the same person was the... Uh, uh, Head, the chief executive, speaker of the house, and head of the courts. And the people didn't like the potential for that concentration of power. So they rejected this first constitution. And so the next year, in 81, there was another constitutional convention, and another constitution was written. And this one produced a Bill of Rights that is nearly identical to what we have now. And this is what's said to be a knockoff on the Massachusetts Convention, uh, Constitution. But it's not. Because if I've got a table of all the liberties codified in the New Hampshire Constitution. And I've looked through the bills of rights, or, or the uh, some of the states don't have bills of rights, but you have fundamental rights listed within the body of the Constitution. And there's a, I came up with about 15 basic rights, grievance, government by consent, um, protection of natural rights, uh, the power of original citizens derived from the people, all these uh, basic rights. And if you do the spreadsheet, some of the states have only two or three of them. Uh, Massachusetts has almost all of them. Only New Hampshire has all of them. That's because when they sat down in 1781, that was now the last one, and they had the advantage of looking back over all the other state constitutions, looking what they said right and what they said wrong. You think some of the uh, uh, specific differences, uh, for instance, from Massachusetts, everybody says, oh, New Hampshire has this great Article 10, it's the right to revolution, it's the only state that has it wrong. And at that time, there were five other states had that right to revolution codified. 